Well, for um, the remainder of uh, the course, actually, uh, G will just be a finite dimensional semi simple Lie algebra. And we're really just beginning now the, the, the process of uh, the, the classification of such uh, Lie algebras G. So the last thing we did was the Jordan decomposition. So we know that any element x in G can be written as x equals x s plus x n with these guys commuting. And that's the semi-simple part. And that's the nilpotent part of x. So they act semi-simply, diagonalizably, or nilpotently on every finite dimensional representation of G. So that was our Jordan decomposition. Okay, so now we've got Jordan decomposition, we can make the following definition. A toral subalgebra of G is a subalgebra consisting purely of semi-simple elements. Okay, so that's the whole point of this Jordan decomposition. We can talk about semi-simple and nilpotent elements, and any element decomposes as the sum of a semi-simple part and a nilpotent part. Toral subalgebra, a subalgebra consisting just of semi-simple elements. Lemma, if T is a toral subalgebra of G, well, T is abelian. So let's prove this. This is pretty easy. So I'm going to take an element X in T. So now what have we got? We've got add X. So this is a linear map from G to G. This is semi-simple because we're assuming T is toral. All its elements are semi-simple elements. And it leaves uh, the subspace T invariant its restriction. Is semi-simple too. Remember, if you have a if you have a diagonalizable endomorphism of some finite dimensional vector space, uh, and you've, you've got some subspace that it leaves invariant, the restriction to that subspace is diagonalizable again. That's a basic fact in linear algebra. Okay, so we may as well take some y in T which is just an eigenvector for x. And it's enough to show that actually this uh, lambda equals 0. Right? So, so basically, I'm trying to show that the, actually the only um, eigenspace that appears uh, in this action of add x on t is the 0 eigenspace. Right? So I'm taking an eigenvector and I'm showing the eigenvalue is 0, that will imply that, that x commutes with everything in t, hence t is abelian. Okay, so we've got this, this element x in t and y, and xy is lambda y, and we're trying to show that lambda equals 0. So now I'm going to look at add y from t to t. This is also diagonalizable. So we can write x as a sum of x mu's, where x mu is an eigenvalue for y of eigenvalue. x mu is an eigenvector for y of eigenvalue mu. 
Okay, so this is sort of just decomposing this x as a sum of eigenvectors of different eigenvalues for add y. Now I'm going to compute y of y of x mu. Uh, sorry, of x by, by using this decomposition. Okay, so y of y of x. Well, hang on, we know already that the bracket yx is minus lambda y. So that's zero. But I can also write it as the sum over all mu's, y, y, x mu. And uh, y acts on x mu just as, as the scalar mu. And then do it again. And you get mu squared x mu. So this shows that the sum mu in C, mu squared x mu, is 0. Now, these, these x mu's, they're in different eigenspaces, right? So they're linearly independent. Um, so from this, we get that mu squared x mu is 0 for all mu. Uh, so uh, either mu is 0, or if mu is non-zero, x mu is 0. So this actually shows that, in fact, x equals x zero. The only non-zero x mu is when mu is zero. And so actually y with x is just zero times x. Hence, this uh, lambda at the beginning is zero, and that was what we needed to prove the lemma. OK, great. So torals have algebras are abelian. So now let's take some t inside g, toral, hence abelian. As add x from g to g is diagonalizable for all x in t, because this element's are semi-simple, so they're diagonalizable in any finite dimensional representation, in particular the adjoint representation. And these endomorphisms all commute as x ranges over the whole of this abelian subalgebra t. We can simultaneously Diagonalize G with respect to T. So remember, another basic fact about from linear algebra is that if you have two commuting, if you have a family, possibly infinite family of commuting diagonalizable endomorphisms of a finite dimensional vector space, you can simultaneously diagonalize them. So this is what I'm doing. I'm taking this action of T on G. So these are. Uh, commuting diagonalizable endomorphisms, these add x's as x ranges over t, and I'm simultaneously diagonalizing g with respect to those guys. So it's going to be look, it's going to look like the direct sum of some g lambdas. Oh, lambda here actually needs to be a linear functional on t, because it's, it's giving us, uh, so where g lambda is the set of all y in g such that x y is lambda of x y for all x in t. Right, so uh, this lambda is actually a linear functional on t. When you evaluate lambda on a given element x in t, that's the eigenvalue of add x on that y. Right, So these, these lambdas in t star, they're kind of like a, a package of eigenvalues for every element of t. We're looking at a sort of eigenvalue of this uh, commuting space of operators. Okay, so these, these lambdas, they're kind of uh, um, uh, eigenfunctions rather than eigenvalues uh, because we, we've got a, a whole space of operators T rather than a single linear operator. But I usually use just the word 
weight for an element lambda in T star. I think you've seen that already. Okay, so this is just this decomposition of G, this, this G lambda, it's this simultaneous generalized eigenspace for the action of add T on the Lie algebra. Okay, so when I do this, I, I usually find it convenient to let R denote the set of all non-zero elements of T star, such that the corresponding uh, general uh, eigenspace here in this decomposition is non-zero. And so then in that decom in that with that notation this this uh, decomposition that I've just written down well there's the zero weight space and then there's all the other weight spaces indexed by alphas in R of these G alphas and these are all non-zero by by definition of R. And the final thing to observe about this is that this G zero that's exactly all elements of G which commute with everything in T. So that's that could also be denoted CG of T, the centralizer of T in G. Okay, so this is going to be super important, this uh, decomposition right here. So let's uh, box it up there so that you, you see that, that formula. Another little lemma, another very easy one, but so important that I'm going to call it a lemma. If you have two of these weight spaces, G lambda and G mu, well, when you bracket them together, it lands you up in G lambda plus mu. The proof is kind of trivial. It's just you just apply the Jacobi identity. You have to take uh, some Y in here and some Z in here and, and an X in T, and you have to calculate the bracket x with y z and uh, you just use jacobi it acts on y by by lambda of x it acts on z by mu of x and, and they add together and you see that it's acting on the bracket as lambda plus mu of x so that's that's kind of very easy but so important so here here are corollaries uh, corollary one Any x in G alpha is nilpotent. Why is that? Well, so, I mean, it's enough to show that add x is nilpotent. And what add x does is it is, it, is on some uh, G lambda, it adds alpha to that. So it takes G lambda into G lambda plus alpha, and then you do add X again, you're in G lambda plus two alpha, and so on. But hang on, G is finite dimensional, right? So this set R is finite. Uh, so you can't do that forever. So all of the elements of these G alphas um, for, for non-zero alpha, they're just nil potent. Corollary two. If you have lambda and mu in T star with lambda plus mu non-zero, then the lambda weight space and the mu weight space, they are orthogonal with respect to the killing form. Why is that? Well, um, maybe I should write something here. We've got to compute the trace on G of add x, add y for x in g lambda and y in g mu. But add x, add y, it maps g alpha to g alpha plus lambda plus mu. And that's non-zero. Hence, add x, add y is nilpotent, right? Because it, it, it takes a given weight space, it adds something non-zero to that weight space. So you keep going, you, there are only finitely many uh, different weight spaces in here. Uh, so that operator is nilpotent, so it has trace zero.
Okay, so I did prove corollary two, that was good. Um, corollary three. The killing form with respect to G alpha for alpha in R is just zero. That's that's clear because uh, um, this property is satisfied right here, right? So so I'm taking lambda and mu both to equal alpha. Alpha plus alpha is non-zero because alpha is non-zero, um, and. Uh, so this shows that G alpha is orthogonal to G alpha with respect to the killing form. That's, that's that statement. But kappa restricted to G alpha plus G minus alpha is non-degenerate. And kappa restricted to G zero is non-degenerate. These just follow from corollary two and the non-degeneracy of the bilinear form kappa on G. Right, so uh, uh, um, this uh, corollary two says that G zero is orthogonal to all of the other G alphas, right? Because zero plus alpha is non-zero for alpha in R. So that means that, that, that uh, the killing form on G0 must be non-degenerate. Non uh, indeed, let's go back to our uh, decomposition. G is G0 direct sum, direct sum alpha in R, G alpha. This must actually be an orthogonal direct sum here because uh, that, that uh, corollary 2 says that G0 is orthogonal to all of these G alphas. And these G alphas... Well, G alpha is orthogonal to G beta, except if beta is minus alpha. Uh, and, and so what happens is, in fact, these, these roots, they must kind of come in pairs. If alpha is a root, minus alpha must be a root. Uh, and then uh, you get these uh, G alpha plus G minus alphas. On, on, on those, the killing form is non-degenerate. And then, then to a different beta minus beta pair, those must be orthogonal, and everything's orthogonal to G0. So uh, somehow this, this uh, decomposition into, into these weight spaces, it, it's very nice uh, to see the killing form. Okay, so we've just shown in particular in corollary three that the killing form on G0, remember that was the centralizer in G of T, is non-degenerate. So now we're going to prove a theorem, which is actually quite hard. Let T be a toral subalgebra. As above. Okay, so I'm always thinking about this decomposition because I have good handle on the killing form. I know that the killing form is non-zero on that. That's exactly the centralizer uh, and, and so forth. Then T is a maximal toral subalgebra if and only if T is equal to its centralizer. Remember that's that's this uh, G zero in the in the decomposition that I've just written. Okay, so um, let's see if uh, T is equal to the centralizer, then it's pretty clear, right? Uh, if uh, T was not maximal, you could find some t hat strictly bigger than t a bigger toral subalgebra but then t hat would be abelian 
by the lemma ends. It would live inside the centralizer of T, which would contradict what we're assuming that, that in fact the centralizer is just T. Okay, so that direction is really trivial, but it's still really useful. Uh, the hard direction is the forward direction. So I'm going to suppose that T is a maximal toral subalgebra. I'm going to let H be the centralizer of T in G, and the goal is to show that H equals T. Okay, so that, that's where we're going. So this takes quite a while, and, and I'm going to kind of proceed with a, with a bunch of steps. So uh, here's step one. So I'm going to show that H contains the semi-simple and nilpotent parts of all of its elements. Okay, so to see this, note that x is in h if and only if add x on t is just 0. But as uh, add x s and add x n are polynomials in add x with constant term 0, So here I'm using this thing, we've used it many times. This is just the semi-simple part of add x, and this is just the nilpotent part of add x. And our very original Jordan decomposition from linear algebra showed that the semi-simple and nilpotent parts were just polynomials in that endomorphism with constant term zero. This is important now. Now x is in h means add x of t is zero, so any polynomial in add x with constant term zero is zero on t, so it follows that add x s on t and add x n on t are both zero, so indeed x s and x n lie in h2. Okay, so that's, that's step one. Step two, all semi-simple elements of H actually already belong to T. This is the one place where we're going to use the maximality of T. So we're going to simply take X in the centralizer, that's semi-simple. So being in the centralizer, it means that it commutes with all elements of T, right? That's, that's our basic definition. Then if we look at T, together with x, right, the span of t and x. This is a subalgebra of g because x commutes with t, right? So this is definitely closed under the Lie bracket. And everything in t is semi-simple and x is semi-simple. And commuting semi-simple elements are again semi-simple. So all elements of this subalgebra are actually toral are semi-simple elements. So this is actually a toral subalgebra of G. Hence, it equals T by the maximality. This shows that indeed X has to belong to T. And we're done in step two. Okay. Step three, I'm going to show that add x restricted to h is nilpotent, a nilpotent endomorphism for all x in h. Okay, this, this so, so I'm not claiming that add x is nilpotent as a map from g to g, but just its restriction down to h. This shows, by the way, that uh, h is... Uh, a nilpotent Lie algebra using Engel's theorem. Um, but, but uh, well, we're going to show that H is T in a little while, uh, so that's not, not very interesting. Okay, so let's take 
an x in h. So x is xs plus xn with xs and xn both being in h by 1. As xs is actually in t by 2, add xs restricted down to h is actually 0, right? Because h is the centralizer of t and xs is in t by step 2. Also, add xn is nilpotent. This is, this is even as an endomorphism of g. So certainly its restriction down to h is nilpotent. So now we've got to add xs and add xn. Um, commuting nilpotent endomorphisms of H and commuting nilpotent endomorphisms, well, their sum is nilpotent. And that's what we were trying to prove. Okay, so, so, so that's all straightforward enough. Now let's show that uh, the killing form restricted down to T is non-degenerate. So the thing is that we know that the killing form restricted down to H, the centralizer, is non-degenerate already because that was my corollary three from earlier. So let's take some x in t with kappa of x and with t equal to zero, right? So this would be an x in the radical of that restriction. So we want to show that x is zero, to show that this restriction of the form is non-degenerate. To do this, it's a, so to show that x equals 0, because we know that the restriction of capita H is non-degenerate, it suffices to show that kappa of xy is 0 for all y in H. But that's equal to kappa of x, y is ys plus yn, and that's kappa of xys plus kappa of xyn. Now, what have we got here? We know that ys is the semi-simple part of something in H, so that's in T by, I think that was step two. Um, but uh, um, we're assuming that uh, kappa of x with everything in T is zero, so that first part is just a, a zero right there. So that's just a zero. And uh, so now we're looking at uh, kappa of x, y, n. Maybe I need to go to the next page. It remains to show kappa of x, y, n is zero. But you see, add x and add y, n commute. This is semi simple and this is nilpotent. So their composition is nilpotent. Let's put that all on one line. Hence, its trace is zero as required. Okay, so that does the job. We've proved the next step. Now I'm going to show 
that uh, so we've just we've just established that the, the restriction of the killing form down to T is non-degenerate, and we already knew its restriction down to H is non-degenerate. So I'm moving on. I'm now going to show that H is abelian. We know T is abelian, but not H yet. So suppose not. Then the derived subalgebra H zero is non-zero. I'm going to consider the adjoint action of H on H prime. For X in H, add X from H prime to H prime is nilpotent. That follows from step three. It was even nilpotent as a linear map from H to H. So certainly its restriction down to H prime is nilpotent. So now by Engel's theorem, we can find some uh, eigenvector for the action of h uh, of uh, and it's nilpotent so so of eigenvalue zero but engels was saying you, you could find this nice basis which was strictly up a triangular for everything in h so some nice basis for h prime where everything in h acts strictly up a triangularly okay so we can find some y in h prime so the bracket of everything in h with y is just zero now i'm going to look at the decomposition of y into its semi-simple and nilpotent parts so ys and yn both lie in h by one and we ha have that uh, H Y S is H Y N is zero too. Right, we knew that we knew that everything in H bracketed with Y to zero, but you see the semi-simple and the nilpotent parts, they're just uh, um, so this is something you you can you we're just looking at add here, right? That that so we're we're showing that add Y S and add Y N both uh, kill H. But add y s and add y n are polynomials in add y with constant term zero so this is this step we've used before so now we can look at kappa of y let's look at kappa of y n with h so this is zero because add y n composed with add x is nilpotent for all x in h. Right, we've done these sort of arguments before now. Right, you see, these guys commute, uh, um, and uh, um, add y n is nilpotent. So that composition is definitely nilpotent, uh, and. If, if you're nilpotent, your trace is zero. Okay, so this shows that kappa of y n with h is zero, but by step four, the killing form is non. Uh, not even by step four, um, as kappa restricted to h is non-degenerate. By corollary three, this gives that uh, this y n is zero. So now we've shown that this y is semi-simple. Yeah, we, we're nearly there. Um, but that means that y is actually in t by step two, right? So it's a semi-simple part of h. And now let's look at kappa of t with h prime, right? y is an element of h prime. 
well, that, so that's the killing form of T with the bracket of H with itself. And by associativity of the killing form, that's going to be, so I'm doing everything as sets here, which is a, bit, a little bit clumsy maybe, um, but there we go. Uh, so I can use the associative property of the killing form, and H centralizes T, so that's just zero. But now we've got this element y in t, and we've just shown that its killing form with everything in t is zero, but the killing form on t is non-degenerate by step four. This shows y equals zero. Okay, so now we've shown that this element uh, y in h prime, uh, which I should have said right there, was non-zero. Um, it was a non-zero eigenvector right there. I've now shown that this y is zero, uh, and that's the contradiction that we need to prove step five. Okay, so we've shown h is abelian, and finally we can finish it all off and show that h equals t by steps one and two. It suffices to show that if you have an x in h with x nilpotent, that it's actually zero. Okay, so so uh, uh, every every element x in h has its semi-simple and nilpotent parts are in h, semi-simple parts in t by step two. So all we have to do is show that its nilpotent part um, is zero. So so in other words, we're just trying to show that that every nilpotent element of h is actually zero. But if we take such an x, that's 0 by step 5, because h is abelian, right? And uh, add x is nilpotent, by definition of what it means to be a nilpotent element. So the killing form of x with h is just uh, 0 because it's, we're taking the trace of add x, add y. And uh, these guys commute, and this one's nilpotent. Uh, so this composite is nilpotent, and so it has trace 0. Um, but that implies that x equals 0, because the killing form is non-degenerate on h. And that does it. I'm sorry, it's a kind of a long and, and, and multi-stepped proof there. Okay, great. So let's just uh, summarize what we've got here. When you choose T to be a maximal toral subalgebra, you get a decomposition. G is G0, but that, that theorem we've just proved shows that G0 equals T. And then you get this direct sum of all these G alphas, um, where alpha where R is, is just as I defined before. And I remember I noted that this was actually an orthogonal decomposition. And the killing form restricted to T is non-degenerate. And uh, for every alpha, in R, um, you must have minus alpha in R. And then the killing form is non-degenerate on these guys. And then. Um, all of these different components, T, in each of these G alpha, G minus alpha pairs, they're all just orthogonal with respect to the killing form. So this is super important, this decomposition. It's called the Cartan decomposition. Of G 
with respect to t. Of course, it depends on t, the choice of that maximal toral subalgebra. Um, the set R is called the root system. And alpha in R is called a root. These uh, non-zero weights for the adjoint action of this maximal toral subalgebra on G.